voices to God as we sing our praise to Him. Hallelujah. Let's do this together, church. Come on. God will reign forever, and all the world will know His name. Everyone together, sing the song of the Redeemer. I know my Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. praising Jesus as a privilege there's no fear just pure breakthrough and freedom to praise God come on lift your voice lift your clap offering to God let's do this together gateway amen father receive our praise receive our worship we invite you in this place God we love you so much Let praise be the 
victory Let it rise Let praise arise Let it rise We'll see you break down every wall We'll watch the giants fall Fear cannot survive when we praise you The God of breakthroughs on our side Forever lift him high With all creation cry God we praise Yeah. 
my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail.
And should I stumble again Till I'm caught in your grace Everlasting Your light will shine when all else fades It's never ending Your glory goes beyond all things myself in bringing you praise everlasting your light will shine when all else fades never ending your glory goes beyond all things my heart and my soul I give you control Come to me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise be combined and praise to love you from the inside out. Everlasting, your light will shine when all this face never ending. Your glory.
We are so blessed. It's time for us to bless our neighbors, greet them with your beautiful smile, have a moment, take a few steps, and after that, turn your eyes on the screen for the announcements. God bless you, Gateway. Thank you so much. Good morning, Gateway. Happy Sunday. Welcome to church. As usual, it is a great day to be in God's house, and we are so happy that each and every one of you are here with us today. If you're a guest with us, we want to extend a special Gateway welcome to you. We are so glad that you chose to come and spend your Sunday at Gateway, and we are honored that you are here with us. And if this is your first time and you don't have a church home, we want to invite you to come back and join us again for another Sunday. Give us another chance and make yourself here at home at Gateway. If you are a guest with us today, we want to acknowledge you by giving you a guest gift bag at the end of today's service. So if you're that first time guest at the end of the service, you can head to a table at the southwest corner of the auditorium where you will find a friendly Gateway volunteer ready to give you a guest gift bag if you just let them know it's your first time here today. Also at that table, we have Bibles. So if you are in church today and you don't have a Bible of your very own, we want to make sure you have one in your hands before you leave church. At the end of the service, head to that table at the southwest corner of the auditorium and request a Bible from our friendly Gateway volunteer. Make sure you're staying up to date with life here at Gateway by following us on social media. You can find us on Instagram at gateway.regina and on Facebook and YouTube at Gateway Church Regina. We have a group of our very first graduates from our Gateway Discipleship Program that happens on Tuesday nights right here at the church, finishing this 12-week course this Tuesday. So congratulations to everyone that participated in this course and finished our Getting a Grip on the Basics Discipleship course. So just a reminder, that course is now finished for this season, but we'll be resuming again soon. So if you want to get in on this class next time, stay tuned for the dates and details right here. This coming Friday, April 12th at 7 p.m. is our next water baptism celebration. We are so excited to be celebrating with everyone taking this next step in their walk with the Lord and being baptized. So Gateway, we want to encourage you to come on out Friday at 7 and celebrate with those taking this step. Be here to cheer them on. We'll see you here Friday at 7. May is going to be a busy month at Gateway. It's Mother's Day. We have a few special events and special guests coming. So make sure you're staying tuned to our online church calendar at gatewayonline.ca slash what's happening for everything you need to know going on here at the church. Of course, we'll be keeping you updated right here with our weekly announcements for everything you need to know about those special events coming up in May. Come Together is also right around the corner. That is a special event happening here in Regina the weekend of June 7th to 8th. Now this is a stadium event happening at Mosaic Stadium. Churches from all across Regina are coming together to lift the name of Jesus high. This is a worship event happening on Friday night and Saturday night. And we are coming together to bring people to know Jesus. So this is really an outreach event. Gateway, we wanna be encouraging you to invite friends and family to come with you to come together. So today following the service at the info desk, you can pick up some invitation cards. Now there's two different types of invitation cards. One invitation is for those who are in your circle of influence that are already Christians. And then there's a second invitation for those that you may know that are not Christians. So grab a few of both invitations, pray over them and use them to invite people to come to come together. We want this event to be life changing and for people to come to know Jesus. So let's be inviting people to come together. Also, this is a big event, and as you can imagine, it takes many volunteers, and the churches of Regina are providing those volunteers. So Gateway, we know you're great volunteers, and we want to encourage you to head to cometogether.day to sign up to be a volunteer at that event happening on June 7th and 8th. And also at cometogether.day is where you can register to get your free tickets for the event. So we'll see you at Come Together on June 7th and 8th. Thank you, Gateway, for your continued giving into God's house, your obedience to God's word, and bringing your tithe into the local church. By your faithful giving, we are able to keep our doors open, keep church moving forward, being the hands and feet of Jesus locally and abroad with our missions partners. So there's three ways you can give today. The first is by giving in person. You can drop your giving in one of the giving boxes at the end of today's service. The second way to give is by giving online. Head to gatewayonline.ca slash give or you can give by card or PayPal. And the third way to give is text to give. Simply text the word give to the number that's on the screen right now and follow the prompts. 
that's all I got for you, Gateway. So have a great week. We look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday. Now, today we have a special guest with us in our service, Dr. Niyi. So Pastor Brian is going to come and introduce him. After Pastor Brian introduces him, please, Gateway, give him a great big Gateway welcome and make him feel so at home with us today. All right, good morning, Gateway. It's a great day to be in church. Come on, that was weak. I said it's a great day to be in the house of God. Just turn to somebody right now and say, success begins on Sunday. You know it's true. Wow, you are well positioned this morning, and the fact is, we're not only glad that each one of you is able to be here, but we are so honored this morning to have Dr. Niyi here, and, and I'm not going to give him the proper introduction. I'm going to ask Wally Adabogan to come and do that, because these two men have been friends since boyhood, and what a special thing for, for Wally to have his dear friend in the house this morning. And so, Wally, come on ahead and introduce Doctor. All right. Thank you, Pastor Brian. Let's give Jesus a big hand of praise. Yeah. How are you all doing this morning? Doing good? The weather is nice today. Yeah. Finally, we had to throw away those jackets, right? And we had to order this special weather for him because he's from Australia. <laughs> Right. Um, so thank you, Pastor Brian. First of all, let's celebrate Pastor Brian, Pastor Bob. Thank you for having us today. I uh, really appreciate you. Um, when you asked me to talk about Dr. Neo, I was like, hey, I, I don't know what to talk about because uh, I want to talk about the good sides. <laughs> right. So um, it, it is a great, great man of God, first of all. Um, and as Pastor Brian said, we've known each other. We grew up together. We're into the same high school as well, same church. Uh, for those of you who know about Anglican Church, you have this society. So uh, both our moms are in the same society at church. They still hard to today um, as well. And so um, I've had the privilege of, of calling him my friend for, I would say, probably over 20 years that we've uh, known each other for sure. And he's a neurologist. Uh, he's a man of many parts, I would say. So everything about the brain, you can ask him. He does his specialty. He's won awards in that area. Uh, very smart guy, smarter, really, really smart. Uh, cerebral, I think that's the word that you can say. Um, he's not only a medical doctor. He also has a PhD, so he's well-read. Uh, had a lot of presentation. He's an entrepreneur as well. He runs his clinic. Um, so he's certainly a man of many ways, but... Uh, also, he's a dad as well, dad to two boys, uh, Daniel and Ethan, and then the wife, uh, Yemi, as well. So, um, what else? Most importantly, I just want to say he's a lover of God. He's a lover of Jesus. You know, it's beautiful that uh, you get to achieve worldly success, but you put Christ at the center of it all. And that's what I see in his life. Uh, he's also a pastor of a church uh, in Australia. He's lived in Australia over 15 years now. Uh, so he's a pastor of church. So it's a privilege for us to have him here t uh, this weekend. We were having a conference yesterday when we were talking about peak performance. I didn't even talk about that. So he's also a peak performance coach. So he coaches executives and leaders uh, on how to really reach your peak, uh, uh, you know, with, with your career and, and just, you know, personal life and stuff. So uh, it's an honor to have you here today. So let's celebrate this lover of God, Dr. Nii Boruri, as it comes up. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Wow, wow, what a welcome. Thank you, thank you. You can be seated. Thank you for having me here. I am so glad to be here. I am excited and I'm delighted to be here. Now, I am originally from Nigeria, and Nigerian men speak fast, and they also speak with a lot of passion, all right? So I'll try to slow it down because I realize that in Regina, everything is quite slow. <laughs> no, people are nice, no traffic, everybody says please. So I just want to try to be as slow as possible. Let me know when my time is almost up because I've got a lot of stuff to talk about. 
I will start by thanking Pastor Brian and Pastor Bob for having me here. Let's put our hands together, you know, for them. Thank you for having me here. I am so honored to be here. Last year when I visited Regina, I came here on a Saturday and you walked me through the church and I'm glad that you've invited me so I don't take it for granted at all. And my very good friend Wally and his wife Elizabeth, thank you guys for all that you do. I also want to thank Jesus. Jesus found me as a 14 year old. I was living a life of, you know, a life of pain and hurt. My parents never got along. My father abused my mom so many times. Um, and life was very miserable for me. I was sad as a 14-year-old. I remember that I was just feeling so depressed. I felt so ungrateful and I felt so hurt about life in general, that why was I born in a third world country to family that had nothing and fought all the time? And I remember a breaking point in my life on a certain Christmas day when we had nothing to eat on Christmas. So the greatest pain a mom can have is to wake up in the morning and not be able to provide for your family. And I remember we had nothing that morning and my mom's heart was so broken. And um, my father wasn't around, you know, and we, we, we just, it was just a miserable morning. Uh, and my mom said she had to go out to hustle. She came back a few hours later with a few unripe plantains. I'm not sure whether you have plantains here. Yeah, they're like ban bananas, you know, with palm oil, with red palm oil. And we ate it on Christmas morning, and we said thanks together. The five of us, five kids, we sat around on the floor with this bowl of palm oil and some unripe plantain for Christmas. And we pray that God will bring food from our neighbors and thankfully, God answered our prayers, and a few people brought some nice rice, jollof rice. <laughs> and that made up for it. But as a 14-year-old, I started to feel that there's more in life, that God has a plan for me. I felt that void in my heart, that there was just something that, that I needed joy, I needed fulfillment, and I needed, I needed something. Life could be more than this. And that started my adventure my walk with God. I gave my life to Jesus. And that's the most important thing I've ever done, giving my life to Jesus. And once I made that pact with God and I surrendered my heart to him, I started to understand the reason why I was born into that family. I, my pain started to make sense. And I realized that God had a plan for me. And I just gave myself to Jesus. And before you know it, I finished high school so early. You know, I think by my 14th birthday, I'd finished high school. By the age of 16, I'd finished my first um, college diploma. And by 17, I got into medical school. And it was tough and difficult at the time because I couldn't even afford my fees. But one day, I was teaching in the Sunday school. I was a Sunday school teacher. And I taught the junior secondary school students. So what you would call, in America, they call them middle school. I don't know what you call it. Is middle school here as well? You know, I was teaching the middle school class. Those kids aged, um, uh, you know, maybe 13, 10 to 13, I teach. And so I was in medical school, but I couldn't afford the fees. And this Sunday I came to church to speak to these kids. And after I did my class, I sat down after church. I was so sad because that week I was dropping out of medical school. And a brother walked up to me. He was also a teacher in the children's church. He said, Nee, why are you sad? I said, well... I'm dropping out of school. You know, my dad is not around. My mom doesn't work. And I'm, just, I'm the only one in, in college in my, you know, out of five kids. And he said, you're not going to drop out. And he said, I'm going to do my best to make sure you have an education. And from that day, this man stood by me. He paid my fees every single year. The Sunday school coordinator did not know that the man paying my school fees was a fellow teacher. The pastor did not know. No one in the church knew. My parents did not know. My mom just saw me rock up to school every day with a smile. But she didn't know that the man paying my fees was a fellow Christian, a fellow believer. And he paid my fees for five years. He gave me an education. The MBBS degree really literally took me away from poverty and set us, my family, a whole generation. He set a whole generation free by paying my fees. Praise God. Praise God. Yeah. And one day when I became an intern, I was watching the BBC 
And I saw a documentary about Australia that Australia needed doctors. And of course, they showed the most beautiful parts of Australia. <laughs> they showed some you know, international doctors, Indians and Pakistani and Chinese doctors with big yards and big houses. I was like, yeah, that is me. <laughs> and within a few months, I took the leap of faith. I knew God wanted me to go. For, I never heard about Australia before, man, until I watched the BBC. It was a one-hour documentary because they needed doctors so bad. Packed up my bags, and I knew Nigeria needed doctors, but man, 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 God, I knew I needed to get out of that place. I packed my bags, and I went on a three months with a three-month tourist visa and 500 Australian dollars, and that was it. Fifteen years later, I'm here. Glory to Jesus. I want to thank God for that journey, and I thank God for what God has done. When I was in high school, I could not talk in public. I was very shy. I was very introverted, and I had problems with my tenses. Is, are, where, was. I struggled a lot. So in case you hear some grammatical errors, please pardon me. All right, but I've come a very long way, and see me here in Regina talking to you amazing people of God. That's what God can do. If you're here and you're, you know, you've got worse trials than I've gone through, if you're here and you're sad, you're despondent, if you're here and there's an emptiness, a void in your heart, if you're here and things are not working well for you and you feel like giving up, if you're here and you feel broken, you've been bruised and bashed by life, heat on the face and the butt, in the belly, in the, your, ne your legs are weak, they can't even hold your weight anymore, your hands are so heavy, you feel like dropping the ball, you feel there's no sense in life, you know. I have come to tell you today that Jesus still cares. And if Jesus could turn me around, if Jesus, if Jesus could take me out of the dust and polish me and put me, you know, here with a nice Italian suit on this beautiful stage, Jesus can do that for you. Jesus can. It doesn't matter how bashed, it doesn't matter how sad, it doesn't matter how low you are. And even if you're living, you're like, your life is not right with Jesus and you're, you keep falling. You know, I'm, I'm a neurologist and I'm really lucky enough to look after patients with lots of neurological dis disorders, addictions and problems. A few weeks ago, I had a young lady who had everything. She had a good husband, beautiful kids, good life, but she suffered from intense, severe anxiety. And she had this delusion that she had motor neuron disease. And I've seen patients with MND. ALS, all right? I've, had, I've lost patients this year with motor neuron disease, and they die very quickly. And I told this young lady with a beautiful kid that you don't have motor neuron disease, but she was so anxious, so overwhelmed, and it was like torture for her. The fact that she could not shake off that thought that she was unwell when she was well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Am I communicating? Yeah. Am I talking too fast? No. You're getting me. You can understand my accent. Yeah. Fantastic. I don't know, I think it's all changed. It's a mixture of Lagos and uh, Sydney and all of that. <laughs> but as I walked, watched this poor lady, you know, I felt so bad for her and I was really moved to tears that people suffer. That for her, her suffering was not financial. She had all the money in this world. She had a loving husband. She had kids. She had a great job. She was a lawyer. But yet she was just crippled by anxiety and with a fear of unknown. She would wake up in the morning with panic attacks, if an irrational fear that had no meaning. And thank God, because when she was in the waiting room, she had Googled my name and she saw me do some teachings on YouTube and she knew I was a pastor and our consultation became, you know, like a you know, healing session. All right, and I had to start to share faith with her because I realized that no pill, no antidepressant would make that difference in her life. And I just felt that she just needed Jesus at that point in time more than anything else. Yeah. Now to my topic. I'm going to be talking today about perceiving the new, and I'll be talking about spiritual perception, the power and the importance of spiritual perception. All right, let us pray. Lord, I thank you for today. Thank you for this wonderful people at Gateway. Thank you because they are your people. I pray in the name of Jesus that your word will come to them with precision, with accuracy, and with power, and that every person here who is spiritually blind or every person here who needs spiritual insight will get it in Jesus' name. Yeah. I pray you heal the brokenhearted. I pray you will raise up those who are weary and those who are about to give up, you give them the energy and the strength to rise up and do your will and establish your kingdom here in Regina to the glory of your name, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Did you like my introduction? 
Fantastic. Now let's get into perceiving the new, okay? Um, I'll read a scripture, Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. Isaiah, I've got 20 minutes, so I'll, I'll be very fast with this. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 19. It says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and not know it and know it? And will you not give heed to it? I would make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Praise God. I want you to know today, the word I've come to tell all of you is that God is doing something new. All right? God is doing something new. God is doing something new. The biggest challenge or the biggest issue is not about God doing something. It's about you perceiving what God is doing. And that's why it says here, Before, behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? It is very possible for you to be right in the middle or in the center of the move of God and not know it. Do you understand what I'm saying? It is possible for God to move all around you. It is possible for God to be moving all around you and you might not even recognize that move of God. You might not even know what God is doing. But God is saying, I am doing a new thing. I am working it out in your life, in your marriage, and I'm building you up, and you may not know it. One day I went to God and I said, God, I'm a doctor. That's what I love doing. You know, for me, medicine is not an, an occupation. Being a doctor is not an occupation. It is a calling. I love my job. There's nothing better in this world than to be paid to do what you love. I love, love being a doctor. All right, I look forward to if I'm already having withdrawal symptoms for not being in clinic this last few days. To be, I'm, I'm, I'm very honest. I just love looking after patients. But I'm also a pastor, and the hardest thing I've ever done is to pastor people, to resolve conflicts. The other day I was on call on a Friday, and on a Saturday I went for a ward round in the stroke unit. After seeing all of the patients on a Saturday, her sister called me. She was having an issue with her husband, so I had to go resolve the problem. I went there, and they were arguing and arguing, and they would not stop, all right? And after three and a half hours of trying to resolve the conflict, all right, and they didn't even offer me a cup of water. I was hungry and I wasn't fasting. My tummy was rumbling. I was. I became lightheaded. Listen, I'm still a human being. If you cut through Pastor Brian's, if you cut through the pastor's veins, it's not anointing that will flow. It's blood, red blood cells. We're humans. I was hungry. I was tired. I was sleep deprived. And here was this couple. They were just, you know, talking about history and what had happened in the past and five years and ten years and twenty years of drama. I was like, man, you guys just joined our church. Uh, is this what pastoring is about? And I was getting frustrated. So I just left them to ramble on. And when I got frustrated and tired, I said, guys, let us pray. So I said, Lord God, I commit your children into your hands. They're not happy. Just help them get over this. Because it was just over, I was just over it. The next day, I came to church, and I saw both of them walking together. And they sat right there, and they were dressed in similar clothing. And I was like, whoa. And while I got out to preach, I realized that there was some romantic vibes between the two of them. They were, you know, they were being romantic to each other and all that. And I was angry. <laughs> I was, I'm telling you the truth. I was on the, on the pulpit and I was, I was just looking at them. They were giggling and they were like, and I was angry. I said, three and a half hours I spent in your house. You didn't give me a cup of water. You didn't even, you know, you didn't even see me off. I stood up, they sat on the lounge, and I left their house. They didn't even open the door. I'm your pastor. You know, I just felt, you know, used. <laughs> and God reminded me, God said, but you prayed. Ah, yeah. uh, so, okay, so it was God, okay, okay. <laughs> so I went back to God, and I said, I'm not pastoring people anymore. It's so hard to deal with people, all right? It's so hard. And God said, look at yourself. You've grown. You're now a better listener. You're now more patient, more tolerant. People disappoint. I never knew what it meant to handle disappointment until I became a pastor. People disappoint you. You invest, you mentor people, and they walk away. And sometimes they do things that hurt you, and you still have to smile to them. The guitarist or the pianist comes very late, or they don't show up for a meeting with a flimsy excuse. If you do that in my practice, I'll give you a query and sack you. But when you do that in church, I say, oh, my sister, oh, my brother, well, God loves you. And I, ah, God loves you. 
because I can't get rid of you. And I, I didn't realize how hard it was to do that. Oh, the other day, my wife and I had a big argument. And pastors and their wives have arguments. And we had to drive to church. And on our way to church, we were not talking in the car. But once we got to the driveway and we saw our people, oh, hello, how are you? <laughs> and on a particular day, my wife was teaching Bible study in church, and it was the role of the father in the church. On the day, we had an argument. <laughs> so she didn't look at my face. She looked away from me and said, fathers, you have to be there for your wives, husbands. And in my heart, I was like, wow, 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 this is good. So right there, I opened up the, my phone and I was looking at the church roster. When is my next, when am I preaching next time? <laughs> Trying to look for a topic about the role of mothers <laughs> and wives. <laughs> you know, after church, we, we got to the driveway of our home. Our kids got into the house and we spent four hours in the car. And I realized that I was just so busy. I've been ignoring my wife and for months she has not been happy. So I was just busy, 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 and I had not had time for her. And she was just so frustrated with me, and I realized that, man, there's something more important than church, my family. Amen. Amen. Gosh. <laughs> God can be doing something new in your life, in your home, and you may not know it. Because most of, of the time as humans, we operate in the sensual, in the physical. So we appreciate our world through our senses, but our senses are limited. Now, that word perception, perception relies on sensation. You can only perceive what you sense. Perception, perception requires contact. You can contrast that with thoughts. Thoughts do not require contact. That's why, as I'm here right now, I can think about my home in Australia. I can think about something that has not existed before. I can think about Pluto, the dwarf planet. I can think about Jesus. I've never seen him physically. Thoughts are limitless. Thoughts are not bound by time or space. You can think about anything. You can imagine anything. Imaginations are visual thoughts. Perception, on the other hand, requires contact. You perceive something that comes within your own sphere of, sens of sensory experience. All right? So you perceive what you can see, what you can hear, what you can feel. So your perception is tied to your senses. The problem we have as humans is that our senses are limited. Uh, the bandwidth of our, of our sight, our vision, our hearing, our feeling is limited. We can hear all frequencies. We can only hear the human, the human here can only appreciate maybe 0 to 60 decibels. Anything higher or less, or no, I think 4 to 60. Anything lower or higher than that, we can't hear. All right? So our ability to hear, our ability to feel and see is limited. But if our physical senses are limited, what about our spiritual senses? What God is doing is far beyond what we can sense. And there are many times that God will move and we will not know it. Jacob said this in the book of Genesis 28 verse 16. Jacob said, the Bible says, Jacob wrote, woke up from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. God is here and I did not see it. God can be moving around you. God can be speaking to you and you may not be aware of what God is doing. All right. And that's because the natural man cannot appreciate spiritual things. In 1 Corinthians 2, 9 to 16, it says, But as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for you. But God has revealed them through his spirit. God has revealed them through his spirit, not through our senses. So God reveals things through us, the spirit. That's where spiritual perception comes in. So spiritual perception is the ability to receive and process and accept revelation. That is what spiritual perception is. Spiritual perception is our ability to get divine insights, to see what God is doing, to get that reassurance when things are bad, when things are tough. When I got to Australia with a three-month storage visa and I got there to get the shock of my life that I was not needed, I thought I watched on the BBC that you needed doctors. I got there and I said, well, we need doctors, but we need doctors from US, from the UK, from Canada, not from a third world country. And you only have one year working experience. Like, you know, and it's true. All I knew then as a doctor was malaria, tuberculosis, and typhoid. <laughs> never heard of ulcerative colitis, multiple sclerosis, never seen any of those diseases. Those are white man's diseases. The black man's disease is different. Half of our wards in the, in the hospital when I was an intern were full of HIV patients. 
So they said, we don't need you. I was like, well, I can learn. I can try. I'm smart. And I was almost giving up. No one would employ me. Everyone said I was unemployable. I was living in a town called Morawas, about 400 kilometers south of Perth, with a population of 660 people. It was a very remote town. We had church once a month. I was there for three months, and we had church once a month. An Anglican priest would come from Perth, would drive about six hours down to have communion with us one Sunday for about half an hour in a month. And that was church for us. I was taught there, and I was like, wow, how, this is not the Australia I saw on TV. <laughs> There's no river here. This is, you know, it was a very remote town. But that was all I could, where I could stay until God gave me a breakthrough and gave me an idea. God, the Spirit of God woke me one day and said, go to the mayor a few days before my visa expired. And I went to the mayor and I said, Mayor, listen, I've applied for a job here in your local clinic. And I've been told that I can't, I can't work there. But I can tell you, I am willing to learn. I am adaptable. I am flexible. And I'll, I would work for you. And I'm very glad that the mayor looked at me. I would never forget his name, Gavin Treasure. I said, what a treasure. And he helped me and he said, okay, we'll make it work for you. And somehow, to cut the long story short, I found my way there. Five years later, Gavin became my patient. He walked in one day to the emergency room. And I went to the pick up the next patient. I picked up the folder, Gavin Treasure, and he came with his wife. He did not recognize me because in five years, I'd gained 20 kilos. And so he sat down in my room. He didn't recognize me. And I said, Mr. Treasure, you don't recognize me, do you? He said, no. And his wife was looking at me, what's going on here? And I said, you kept me in this country. I was about to leave, and God told me to meet you, and you give me a contract when no one will give me. And I didn't even end up working for him because I got an offer while I was waiting to get the clearance. And he released me. He paid, that man paid for my medicals, my visa, and my work permit and all that. And he couldn't recognize. I said, now you're my patient. And we were crying in that room with his wife and the three of us. We just got very emotional. And I gave him a very big hug. And I said, now what's wrong with you? Let's fix you. <laughs> Sometimes when God walks in us and through us, we are oblivious to it. And there are many times when God's hand is around and when God is about to bring a breakthrough that because it may not come in the way we expect, we just ignore it. We have to be sensitive. Amen. So spiritual perception is about connecting with God to get what God wants for us. Now, let me just quickly move into this. What are the things that stop us from really perceiving what God is doing? What are the factors that limit spiritual perception? The first thing I'll quickly mention here is the repetition of our current status. Sometimes, when we are used to a particular situation, we think that's the best we can have. We, we, we just accept the low estate that we are in as the very blessed pasture, that, the best pasture that we can feed on. When you're in a situation, where, you know, that if you've been in a situation for a very long time, you may just assume that that's the best you can get. This is the best that can come out of me. And when you're used to that thing, it stops you from appreciating the new, the new things that God is bringing your way. The biggest challenge to the new is the old. You know, there are three things that the brain, I'm bringing a bit of neuroscience into it right now. There are three things that the brain loves. Our brains love similarity, stability, and security. That's why you're more likely to be attracted to someone that looks like you, that feels like you, that does what you do. Are we together? Our, brain, our brains are naturally wired that way. We like to be stable and secure and to, uh, to, to align ourselves with things or people that are similar to us. So sometimes when God is doing something new that is not similar to what we're used to, the patterns are different. We may not recognize that pattern because of what we're expecting. The Jews were not expecting Jesus to come, you know, to be born in a manger and to come in a, that way. They were expecting a king that would come and destroy the Roman Empire. And because of that, they missed the move of God. Jesus lived with them for 33 and a half years. And yet, a lot of them did not recognize the power and the presence of Jesus. In John 1, the Bible says he came to his own, and his own rejected him. But to those that accepted him, he gave power to become sons. Amen. Yeah. So God can move. God can speak through a donkey. God can speak through a person. God can speak through a lowly me to you. 
And if you're not expecting that, and if your current experience is not, does not align with that, you would miss it. Another thing that stops us from appreciating or receiving what God has for us, or another thing that will limit our spiritual perception, is when the change that is occurring is subtle. We are often quick to recognize sudden, sorry, abrupt changes. When there's a sudden abrupt change, you recognize it. But when a change is sudden, or uh, sorry, is gradual, you may not know it. You know, if you've ever lost weight, you would agree with me that you don't just lose weight overnight. One day I got very motivated when my GP told me I'm overweight and I'm still overweight. So I went to the, to the gym for the first time and I thought I'll lose weight. After the first week, I gained weight. <laughs> Praise God. It's just truth. So perception is harder. Spiritual perception is harder when change is slow and subtle. When you're in that waiting period and you're trusting God for something, you're waiting God for a job or you're waiting for, you know, on God for a partner or for a child or whatever it is that you're waiting on God for, it might appear to you at that time that God is slow and things are not moving, but God may be working in you, doing something that you may not even know what God is doing in you. God told a man to push a rock up to a mountain and he pushed and pushed very hard. When he couldn't do it anymore, he gave up, and God actually used his own finger to roll up the, the rock up the mountain, and just with a flick. So the man became unhappy. God, why did you do that? You told me to push this mountain. Why did you, why couldn't you have, you know, flicked it off yourself? So God brought him a mirror, and God said, look at your chest. Look at your muscles. Look at how built you are. Sometimes I bring obstacles and challenges in your life to build you to develop you, to grow you, to increase your capacity, to teach you patience, to teach you tolerance. And you may not know that. So you may be in a situation right now, you're like, why is my husband so grumpy and hard to communicate with? Why is it that we just have these issues? Why do I have this teenage son that I cannot communicate with? Why is it my boss so hard on me? Why is our business struggling? I remember when we started pastoring, we had, you know, <laughs> in the first three months or so, we had like five or six people in church. So one day, I printed 2,000 invitation cards, gave it to all the different houses in, our, in Liverpool. Liverpool, not Liverpool, the real Liverpool in London. Liverpool in, you know, almost every British city is replicated in Australia. So we have Liverpool, we have Newcastle, we have everything. So I live in Liverpool in Sydney. It's a suburb. And we distributed 2,000 invitation cards. I got my special suit. All right, came to church that day and we had prayed and fasted. It took me four hours to prepare my sermon on the Saturday. So the Sunday I was really expecting God to do great things and I was expecting lots of people in the congregation. Guess what? No one showed up. There were seven of us, my wife, myself, and our two kids and three other people. And while I sat down there, God told me, come on, son, go and preach to this few as if you're preaching to a thousand. It's not easy, man. It's not easy if you're expecting a lot of people and only seven people, and the same seven people. So I got up there. I was like, praise God. My wife thought, what was going on here? Because <laughs> like, why are you, you know, but she didn't hear what I heard. All right. She was there battling with our two-year-old. Our son was two-year-old. He's now eight. He was two at the time. So she was just battling with this two-year-old who was disrupting the service. And I was like, praise the Lord Jesus. So I tried the TDGX thing on them. Hey, man, we didn't have a keyboardist at the time. All right. So we we're just, I was just freestyling the whole thing. And I was preaching with so much energy energy and all that say amen and we'll finish praying of course those days we were hiring a room so we had to pack with my suit i had to pick up all the speakers and carry put them in because the whole church was in my garage so all the stuff we had to pack everything into the garage i'm like oh my god church and then on monday morning i carried my briefcase with another suit went to my office where i just started our medical practice it's a specialist medical practice it was our second month all right so i got there and I sat down and I told my secretary, how many patients today? Three patients, good. At least we'll take some money home, all right? And I sat down there, one hour, no patient. I went back out there, she was on Facebook. I was like, come on, what's going on? Where are the patients? Please, can you chase them up? Can you call them? That day, not a single patient turned up. And so at the end of the day, I took my briefcase, my shoulder was dropped down, and I walked to my car. I was like, gosh. Why am I going through this? Sunday service was a... Mm, and then Monday morning, nothing. And I don't earn a salary. If I don't see sick patients, I don't earn. So I need people to be sick. 
it's just a fact of life. You've got to be sick for me to get paid. So uh, I go home and I was like, God, what is going on now? I was so frustrated and I was almost giving up. But God gave me a word. Hang in there. Keep swinging. People in my church hear that a lot. Keep swinging. Keep swinging. It may be tough. It may be hard. Keep swinging. And that word kept me. Are we together? Yeah. Now we have three locations. We have three practices in three different locations. We've got over 5,000 or 6,000 patients. We have over seven staff, different doctors and, you know, and, and all that, technicians and all that in our practice. And our church has grown. We bought our own property and we're doing quite well. Praise God. Put your hands together for Jesus. Got five minutes to go. What else can limit your spiritual perception? Your experiences, your successes. Sometimes what stops us from going for the great is the good. We get too comfortable with our successes. And that alters our spiritual perception. A particular research was carried out in the U.S. where they got a few football players to kick in the ball into a, a football post, you know, into the net. And after they, they did that, they divided the two, the groups that kicked in successfully and those that failed. They divided them into two groups and told each group to estimate the size of the post. Those that kicked it in under, oh sorry, overestimated the size. They thought the post was bigger than what it really was. And those that did not kick in thought it was smaller than it really was. But the post was the same. You know the difference? Perception. Are we together? I may preach right now, and some people here will be, this is the best thing we've ever heard. Pastor Brand, bring him back. And some people will be able to like, uh, I didn't hear a single word. <laughs> Same preacher, people perceive differently. Are we together? Yeah. It's just a fact of life. Yeah. So your experiences, your expectations, your biases, are we all right affected? And we're, we're like that. Sometimes, you know how many times people have walked into my office? All right, I'm only one of two black neurologists in all of Australia and New Zealand. So people walk into my office and they, they, because sometimes I wear scrubs and they're like, can I see the doctor? I am the doctor. <laughs> I own this place. You're here to see me. And of course, my name, Boriri, people would sometimes pronounce it Boriah. So they think it's a French name. And they're looking for, most neurologists are like middle-aged, white-haired, Caucasian men. So when you see a young black dude, handsome, nice, with glasses and, you know, you're like, what's going on here? Is this? I'm like, no, I am. I am he. So connect with me. Tell me your story. Let me fix your migraine. Tell me. There's no other person, you know. I'm not, I'm not a clerk or a physician assistant. I'm, I'm the person. So sometimes our experiences and what we expect and the image that we've created in our minds can, can do that. And that doesn't make us bad, you know. That doesn't mean that, you know, uh, and I say this a lot, that sometimes, you know, people, the fact that we are naturally wired to look at, to follow our past experiences doesn't make us bad people. That person wasn't racist, so I'm not talking about, you know, racism. The other day I was, I was on my way to Switzerland um, from, on my way to the London from Geneva. So I was in the, in the lounge, the, the business class lounge, and um, queuing for a cup of coffee at about five or six a.m. And a young girl was there trying to operate the coffee machine. She couldn't do that successfully, so she wanted someone to assist her. <laughs> And I was like fourth on the queue. She left the machine, looked around, and saw some men. About two men were in front of me. She didn't approach them. She came to me. She's like seven or eight year old, this girl. Came to me and in French was asking me to help operate the machine. And I was like, you know, I, I can't operate the machine. And of course, I didn't understand why she came looking for me. All right, and of course, our parents stood up and they spoke English and they came and they were like, oh, no, 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 no. It was much later I realized that all these assistants and attendants in the lounge were black people. So for the few hours they had been there waiting for their flight, she had just mixed it up and thought I was an attendant. All right, she's not got any racist bone in her. She's an innocent little kid who's just judged me based on my appearance. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. It's just nature. So it's not racist for people, for you to comment that your society is changing and you have more migrants and you know, things are changing and you have more multi-ethnic society. It's not. It's just the realization. Are we together? But we must be open to understand that, you know, people who don't look like us or talk like us can bring a lot of value into our lives too. 
and it can be a blessing to us. Yeah. Are we together? Yeah. Um, am I making you uncomfortable? <laughs> well, I'm here. Finally, as I bring this to a close, I'll finish up with the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. In Genesis chapter 17, God appeared to Abraham when he was 99 years of age. And God told him that God made a covenant with him. God said, walk before me and be perfect. Sorry, I need water. God said, walk before me and be perfect. And when God said that, God changed his name from Abraham to Abraham. And God appeared to him in a vision in chapter 17. And that was it. Abraham got that revelation. He had that vision. And God said, walk before me, be perfect. I made a covenant with him. And that was it. Guess what? In chapter 18 of Genesis, this was a man who was 99 years of age. The Bible says in verse 1 again, a God appeared to him. But this time, did God appear to him in a vision? No. The Bible says that Abraham sat in front of the tent of his house in Mamre, and in verse 2, he saw three men. The same God that appeared to him in chapter 17 in a vision appeared to him in chapter 18 in the form of three men. And the Bible says that Abraham ran. He recognized God. Let me tell you the, you know, the power of spiritual perception. The same man who saw God in a vision recognized God in three men, physical men. He ran out at the age of 99, prostrated, greeted them, brought them to his tent, got his wife to make nice bread and dress some nice meal. And the Bible says he waited on them. He stood there and he waited as they were eating. And as he waited on them, standing there, observing these three men, and I reckon they probably will be younger men than him physically. He waited on them. The man said, Abraham, this time next year, you will have a son. God could have appeared to you in a vision before, but now he may appear to you in a different way. Are we together? But he's still God. If Abraham had not stood up, entertained those people, he probably would have missed that confirmation of what God wanted to do. Do you understand what I'm saying? But Abraham was flexible enough. He was mature in his understanding that God can walk in different ways. As the heavens are above the earth, his thoughts are above our own thoughts. And when we are flexible enough and we allow the Spirit of God to lead us and we are sensitive to what he's doing, we will be able to benefit from what he has in store for us. If you're here and you have that emptiness in your heart and you feel that you're stuck, this is, the, this is your moment, this is your time. I won't leave this pulpit, this stage, without inviting you to Jesus. I enjoyed Jesus when I was 14. I have never left him since then. He's been there for me. I've had tough moments in my life. I've had, I was raped when I was the six, at the age of six. That scared me for life. I suffered abuse. I was addicted to pornography. That crippled me. But Jesus brought me out of all those things. He gave my life a meaning and he gave me a voice. He made a difference in my life and he has given me a message of hope and transformation for other people. So please join me. You can't afford to leave this place without Jesus. If you're here and you've tasted Jesus before and you've drifted away, this is your moment. I've come all the way from down under to tell you that Jesus still saves. Jesus still heals. Jesus still cares for you. And Jesus can make a difference. So why not bow down your heads? Sorry, my time is up. My time is up. I can see the time. Please, this is your moment. If you want to reconnect, bow all heads bowed. Eyes closed, the choir, yes, you can come up. Just give, make, make that choice right now. I want to pray with you. If you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus, just put your hands up. Just lift your hands up right now. Or if you've been with Jesus and you've walked away, just say, Lord Jesus, I come back home. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I've left you. I recognize that I do not have a relationship with you. I'm coming back. Change me, oh God. Put your spirit in me and transform me in Jesus name let me pray with you Lord I thank you for every single person here who is taking this bold step to come you, to come back to you oh God Lord I pray in Jesus name that you bring them back to the fold you wash them by your blood you write their names in the book of life and you give them hope for the future a great hope of eternal life with you in Jesus name 
And for everyone else here, I pray in the name of Jesus that you renew our spiritual perception. You open our eyes so that we will see and we'll perceive your move, oh God. We will not rely on our past experience. We will trust you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. Thanks for having me. strong expression of gratitude to Dr. Nii for his message to us this morning. What a great word that is. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Remember a few moments ago, Dr. Nii was saying, you know, our perception of this address this morning will be different. Some will say, let's have him back again. Others will say, no, let's not. I am pretty sure that everybody in the house is going to be saying, Pastor Brian, if that guy comes back to Regina, you got to pin him down and get him to commit to come and share with us again. That is just so rich to be able to receive that instruction from a man who knows what he's talking about because he walks with God and because he walks in a professional realm that gives him the expertise to be able to tell us what's going on. You know, I personally, I really love that point that you made about not settling for your current status. Come on, how many of us here this morning know we can be better, we can do better, we can excel in greater ways because the Lord is doing a new thing in us and around us. And we can certainly, be a part of what the Lord is doing in our generation. Wow, so good. So good to receive that word this morning. Thank you again, Dr. Nee, and uh, for sure the invitation will be. Uh, I don't know, he was in town a year ago. He's in town now, and Lord willing, by faith, he's going to be back in Regina again next year. You understand, he's doing a North American tour. He's making a few different Stops along the way, Regina, Vancouver, Atlanta, I believe, and also Houston. Yeah, so for, this is first stop along the way, and so we welcome you. We so thank you for being with us this morning. And, and folks, as you go from church today, we're going to wrap it up with one more song in just a moment. But, but listen, as you go from, from church today, if you prayed that prayer a few moments ago to say, yes, please, Jesus, I need you in my life. Listen, there's a couple of things I could suggest. One is get yourself to the southwest corner of the auditorium when the service is over because there'll be somebody there that's got some great literature that they want to put in your hands. The, the other option is, hey, when the service is over, this altar is open, our prayer partners will be on hand. And if you would really like some one-on-one -on -one personal prayer, just make your way up to the altar when this song is over, and, and uh, there'll be somebody here that would be so happy to pray with you. By the way, doctor, do you have a book table out in the lobby? We got a book table going? Awesome. Listen, if you would like to take advantage of this opportunity to purchase some of the material, some of the different books that Dr. Nee has written, that'll be available at the book table out in the lobby. And, and I just uh, highly recommend you do that. And so, Gateway, thank you so much for being here this morning. Oh, the blessing of God. Be rich and rewarding upon every household represented here today. As we go from church, the Holy Spirit lead you and give you an amazing week as you reach out to others in Jesus' name. All right. Thank you for joining our online service today. We pray that you were so encouraged by the worship and the message. And hey, if you've been blessed by the worship and the messages here at Gateway, we'd love if you partner with us. You can head to gatewayonline.ca slash give to do so. And if you're in the Regina area, we would love to have you join us in person for one of our services very soon. There's a chair here waiting for you. But if you're not able to make it in person in Regina, we'll see you right back here next Sunday for another Church Online.